want to welcome the first speaker um, of, of, of this session of Emerging Futures, uh, who, someone that I consider a friend and, and, and someone I can talk very frankly. And you know, you can, you know, you can, it's very rare that you can find people that you can to talk so frankly with. Um, and that's uh, Dr. Ron English, uh, who is a professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan. Uh, he receives his bachelor's in cybernetics, his master's in systems engineering, and his PhD in history of consciousness, all from the University of California. Ron, uh, I think that I will leave the network to discover your work. I won't tell them what you're gonna talk about, but the stage is yours. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Tomas. All right, let me do my uh, share screen here. And let me put that in presentation mode. Uh, and hopefully folks are now seeing my slideshow. Uh, can you just nod your head and, okay, great. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, restorative technologies for a generative economy. Uh, and the way my talk goes, uh, proceeds from left to right on this screen. So you can see we start with an indigenous uh, heritage algorithm. Uh, we move to a simulation of that heritage algorithm, and then we move to a kind of physical rendering of those ideas. And a good place to start might be with restorative justice. That was first introduced in Detroit in 1958 uh, by a psychologist, Albert Aglash, happens to be my father, um, who was working with incarcerated citizens, returned citizens from prison, and they kept talking about the, the feeling that they needed to make amends. And he realized our justice system was based on retribution, on punishment, revenge, not restitution, bringing things back into balance. And so he introduced these uh, three concepts. At first, there would be a recognition of the harm and the need for repair. And next, an encounter in which both parties would work together on the response. Um, and then finally, a transformation, actual change in the world. My dad was a psychologist, but I'm very interested in how to apply that restorative justice concept to society as a whole, to environment, to industry, to the way we treat each other. And I think uh, those three principles are, are, are good ways to, to think about it, even at that large scale. So first, recognize the harm done. And if I wanted to uh, uh, summarize that in some way, I would say it's about the extraction of value. It's uh, extracting ecological value from nature, from pollution and overharvesting. It's extracting labor value from low paid, unfulfilling jobs, forcing folks onto these assembly lines. And it's extracting social value, colonizing either our physical landscape or our online uh, social networks in some way and enacting different sorts of, of violence as it uh, colonizes the, those areas. The origins of this are in colonialism. And if you look at how colonialism set up extraction, um, of course, it was all about taking over lands. But even after some of those lands were liberated, our minds still tend to be colonized by this pyramid, this hierarchy that colonialists set up. The idea was that uh, Europeans, Western civilization, had the only true science and technology. And as you go down to these uh, tribal societies, to hunter-gatherer societies, you would get less and less until you're, you're with folks that just have no science and technology to speak of. From my point of view, that's a myth. That's something that's been um, placed upon us uh, to view the world through the lens of the colonizers, not through the colonized. If we look for indigenous STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, we don't necessarily see it. Our eyes are not attuned um, to looking for those features. And that was certainly the case for me. So when I first began to look at fractal geometry, at patterns that repeat themselves at many different scales, um, I saw it in these African villages, but I just assumed it was like termite mounds or fractals or coral reefs or fractals that there's a kind of bottom-up self-organization, and so you would naturally produce a kind of uh, self-organized geometry, self-similar fractal patterns. 
And as I started to collect examples from all over the world of indigenous architecture, I realized all the examples of fractals uh, were in those African villages. And that's when it struck me that this was not simply a universal property of indigenous cultures, that there's some kind of knowledge at play here that's specific to these African cultures. So I got a Fulbright to just spend a year traveling around Africa interviewing folks and wrote this book, African Fractals, about that uh, experiments documenting these uh, uh, heritage algorithms. Uh, and in each case, I would interview somebody and say, well, I, I see that your blanket here has diamonds inside of diamonds inside of diamonds. What's up? I see that your little village here has a big circle and a small circle and a smaller circle. So each time um, I got not only the geometry, the computational aspects, but there would also be a kind of backstory that was about um, the spiritual meanings behind this. Um, uh, last summer, we uh, uh, got to film a documentary with Samuel Jackson uh, that's uh, gonna be playing soon. Uh, where we looked at some of these uh, fractals in Ethiopia. So this is me standing in front of a thousand year old stone church and you can see it's got crosses inside of crosses inside of crosses. So even when new cultures would come into contact in Africa, there'd be a kind of uh, syncretism or blending. Um, but the oldest forms would show something like this snake biting its own tail, that recursive loop of the heritage algorithm. And if you look at how materials are fabricated in these societies, you can see why that loop is so very important. So here's uh, my old colleague, uh, Gabriel Boache, passed away unfortunately just last year, uh, getting bark from a tree, the body tree, um, and it gets boiled down in these big vats. Uh, and then the bark is strained, the, the leftover bark where all the, the ink has been taken out is then composted and thrown back into the forest. Um, and these sacred forest spots are, are hot spots of biodiversity. Um, and so they enrich these other areas where they're harvesting the trees. So you can see the whole thing works as a, a circular system. And the ink that they're extracting from the bark is used to stamp these cloths. So you get this beautiful symbol system um, that uh, uh, promulgates the cultural ideas uh, that keep things egalitarian, that keeps th things uh, circulating. So this gives us uh, a, a, a bit of an understanding of why it is we have such a hard time recognizing indigenous STEM. Western STEM was created for the purpose of value extraction. You have a giant plantation and monocropping to optimize that, that one you know, cash crop that you want. You've got a giant factory that's extracting as much value out of workers as you can. So of course you produce a science and technology that's quite different from the societies whose goal is to prevent value extraction, to nurture circulation, to, to nurture unalienated value flow. That's why we have such a difficult time seeing it when it's right in front of our noses. So uh, in Indonesia, um, in uh, Northern India, you see these beautiful bridges that are uh, made of living trees. They'll take a couple of roots from the ficus tree and stretch them across the, the river, um, and then uh, uh, over time, you add more and more roots to it, and finally you get a structure that's strong enough to cross on foot, uh, and over time, over several generations, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So if Western engineers came up with a bridge that was self-healing, self-repairing, that strengthened over time instead of decaying like our current infrastructure does, It'd be New York Times headlines, right? Oh my gosh, uh, brilliant uh, nanotechnology. But of course, when indigenous folks do it, it's dismissed as, oh yeah, they're using nature, you know, very crude. Um, so we really have to look at these things with very different, uh, through very different lens if we wanna catch on to the sophistication and the complexity of what's happening in these indigenous societies. Now I mentioned uh, Detroit 1958 restorative justice principles started with that uh, recognition of the damage and certainly that pyramid form uh, is part of that damage, that myth that state societies are the only ones that have science and technology. We could invert that. So we could say, okay, so state societies will give you that. You are the most extractive, congratulations. But we could invert the pyramid and say the indigenous societies are in fact the most generative STEM, right? Um, and 
part two of that restorative justice process was this encounter in which both parties would come together and work as a response. So that's the question I'm raising here, is how do we bring together those digital technologies and, and the brilliance of those generative cycles? So we've created this website, uh, Culturally Situated Design Tools, csdt.org, um, and it's uh, free for use, open source. Anybody can go on there and just play around with uh, the simulations, uh, look at the cultural background of these, these different societies and how they created these heritage algorithms. Um, and we've had really great responses from the National Science Foundation supporting this for K through 12 education. Um, the kids are very creative. You can give them a, a heritage algorithm and they'll immediately start just getting creative with it and say, yeah, I, I know, you know, grandma made that cool looking Navajo rug, but I, I, you know, I'm living in 2020. I wanna make my own version of what constitutes Navajo weaving right here on the screen. Um, and so the kids start playing around with math and computing ideas as if they're, you know, paintbrushes and, and crayons, just wonderful uh, creativity that we see in those encounters. The next step, uh, we physically render those designs. So whatever it was on the screen, you can use laser cutters or 3D printers, uh, the kinds of digital fabrication uh, that the folks at the Bits and Atoms Center uh, at MIT have, have been uh, uh, helping folks become aware of. And that enabled us to get into uh, the adult economy. So once we started producing these mannequin heads, we could then go to braiding shops and say, hey, is there some way that we could feature these or, or uh, you, could, you could make use of these? Um, and there's been a really fantastic ex uh, response from adult entrepreneurs uh, about working with the, the younger generation on these simulations. I find that um, they're very different depending on where they're located. So uh, working with African-American kids, they really embrace the 3D printers and the mannequin heads. Working with Native American students, not so much. They really wanted to have that uh, hands-on tactile feeling of fabrication. Um, and so what we did is we had them design virtual designs on the screen, and then we just use a paper printout uh, or we'd use a laser cutter to mark the little spots um, where you'd insert those fiber arcs. Uh, and so it was, it was sort of a cyborg, half uh, traditional, half uh, uh, digital. Um, in the case of West Africa, we found folks doing the stamped, uh, uh, um, stamped cloth tradition using these latex sponges that would wear out, but they wouldn't decompose. And so they asked us if we had a more sustainable solution for that. Um, so we used mushroom foam from the, the Ecovative company back in New York. Uh, we 3D printed the uh, symbols, the Adinkra symbols that they were using uh, in the negative. So it became a little mold and then you could put the mushroom foam and it would grow into that mold uh, and folks could stamp it with a biodegradable stamp. We've also had a lot of luck recently uh, with the laser cutters that we had brought to West Africa. We have another group in Detroit, Michigan uh, that's, that's doing the same sort of thing. Uh, they had actually imported some of the African cloth. There was an African-American group that was doing kind of a, a, a roots fabric thing. Um, and so both groups in West Africa and Detroit um, are using laser cutters to create uh, masks for the COVID pandemic, as well as these beautiful uh, Adinkra designs that are now sewn uh, onto shirts and, and uh, uh, other clothing articles. And then uh, another group in Detroit that uh, we were having a, a, a lot of uh, fun with was the African Bead Museum uh, that Alame Dobbles runs in Detroit. Um, he was uh, running little workshops for kids where he'd just buy a bunch of plastic beads. And I asked him once, well, could we grow the beads? You know, could we, could we reunite making and growing the way it was traditionally done in Africa. And he was pretty excited about that. So we managed to get a small grant to build what we're gonna call the African Futurist Greenhouse. Uh, this is Kisa Johnson Muhammad growing a plant called Job's Tears. And that's used in a beading tradition uh, in Southern Africa. The Zulu have a beading tradition where they, they take these little pericarps that already have a hole um, because the stock goes right through those. So once you harvest them, you don't have to drill anything. Nature's already provided the little hole down the middle. 
Um, and so we're growing that along with uh, food plants. Uh, we have another student that's using artificial intelligence to look at um, both the case of the artisanal fabrics uh, as well as these growing systems to see if there's some way uh, that we can have some, some uh, intelligence built into this with, with uh, sensors and so on. So um, to summarize, if we think about those indigenous traditions, they're quite applicable. Those cycles of unalienated value can be applied uh, in the case of ecological value when we do organic gardening and we compost, in the case of labor value when we have worker-owned production, and in the case of social networks, uh, when we replace uh, platform capitalism with platform cooperativism, when we have open source and code or speech or sexuality or spirituality or whatever the expression is that people want to be able to, uh, to circulate in that authentic form. The problem is we live in a society that still has, you know, the remnants of colonialism and then new forms of neocolonialism. Um, so you need some sort of leverage. And of course, that can be done in the political sphere. But I would like to think that we can do that uh, in the technological sphere as well. And so I think of this third phase of restorative justice, the transformation phase, um, as using the kinds of technologies that the Center for Bits and Atoms has been promoting as a kind of prosthetic. We have a wounded society. Um, we need a kind of restorative technology uh, to bring those cycles back to, to fruition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, <laughs> as I said before, I think that you know it's so it's so refreshing to hear so frankly, uh, you know, and so straightforward um, your readings about the issues of the potential issues that we we might have with technology. Before jumping to uh, and, and that leads that opens up a lot of lost questions, but uh, before jumping into the conversation with uh, or the presentation of Valencia, I wanted to share with you just quickly because it's a very hot topic. Uh, what about cultural appropriation? Uh, you know, you know, we can. You are this. It seems like it's just like in the bond, in, in the border, borderline uh, between using technology to preserve, to maintain, to transmit uh, that cultural values, that diversity that you can find from traditions. But then, where is the limit when it becomes cultural appropriation? With this really, really hot topic. This is from Cindy Kotala, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so first of all, I, sh I should mention our process. Um, we're not just grabbing an artifact off the screen and saying, let's simulate this. Um, we start working with the community and that might be uh, elders in the case of a Native American community. Uh, it might be artists in the case of the inner city. Uh, it, it might be uh, practitioners of some craft in the case of Africa. Um, and we ask permission. We say, look, here, here's what we're going for. Um, we'd like to, to find those sophisticated mathematics that colonists said didn't exist. Uh, and we'd like to turn those into tools that your youth can use. Um, and we'll show them examples of what we've done before. And the response has been amazing. I, I've seen you know, uh, Navajo grandmothers with just tears uh, that their kids were, were uh, no longer gonna be shunning uh, this weaving tradition because now it was in their favorite medium, which was the, the video screen, right? Um, so there's been a, been a terrific response from uh, the, the authentic uh, owners, so to speak, of, of these traditions. Um, and then with youth, you know, when I started out, I was thinking of these things in uh, the terms that I learned growing up in the 60s, that there was this kind of cultural purity, right? Um, but when we work with the youth, they're incredibly creative with bringing together different cultural elements. And so the uh, background section for each of those tools I showed you, the CSDTs, um, if you go to that website, the first thing you'll see is a, a description of where these uh, cultures are getting those practices from. That's incredibly important. And uh, in the case of Appalachian areas, for example, we're talking about the traditions of white people, but it's a white population that's been extremely oppressed. I mean, these coal camps are, are have intergenerational poverty going back many, many years. Um, and so watching Native American kids and African American kids and white kids 
all encounter that material together and discuss it collectively, you know, is really uh, eye-opening. Um, and then even more so when they start producing creations that have that hybridity. So we had an African-American student whose parents were from Jamaica and he simulated the Jamaican flag, but he wanted to use our simulation of the Native American beadloom. And you know, we said, yeah, go for it. Uh, Jamaican flag in, in beadwork. Um, one of the Navajo students spotted that. And so she decided that she was gonna make a Navajo rug based on the beadloom that was based on the Jamaican flag. So the, the cultural blending, you know, it really turns on its, on its head, I think, um, the kinds of assumptions that the older generation has about uh, these, these silos of ethnic purity. Yeah, thank you. I think that definitely hybridization uh, is something that, you know, it's unavoidable. And uh, you know, even now, like uh, we, when we have like, a, you know, these efforts to polarize uh, uh, societies and go back to identity, and we're really forgetting that we are more connected than ever. And probably, you know, the, you know, the fact that the futures that we want to create, uh, they need to include that diversity. It doesn't mean like a war of, of one over the other in the colonial terms, right? It, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's more or less yeah. opening so, a dialogue. Yeah, so right now, all around the world, we're seeing statues being torn down. People are saying, <laughs> you know, why, why do we have to have this big statue honoring somebody who is just a, a virulent racist, right? Um, and we forget about the flip side of that, that there are these unrecognized heroes. So for example, we all do a Boolean search when we go onto Google. Uh, we uh, use uh, Boolean algebra on our computers. George Boole, the guy who invented all that, uh, was white, grew up very poor, and never forgot his roots. So he was uh, uh, quite an advocate for social justice. Uh, and again and again, if you look at the history of mathematics and computing, you can find those folks. Um, they're rarely uh, uh, talked about in those terms. I mean, I got an engineering degree, right? I, I had to do my own digging. I never found out that that uh, Norbert Weiner and and uh, uh, you know these other folks that we think of as the founders of cybernetics or, or different forms of engineering actually had a vision for social justice as well. 